How did transfer quarterbacks do in the SEC last year? I think that information is important because Auburn has two of them. Also, trap games coming up. We talk about it all on today's Locked on Auburn. Well, Zach, I, I actually just finished crushing some chicken farm, and I am freaking ready to rock and roll. You are Locked on Auburn, your daily podcast on the Auburn Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on into Locked On Auburn, your daily Auburn Tigers podcast. I'm your host, Zach Blackerby, and thank you so much for making Locked On Auburn your first listen every single day. Joining us today, Lance Daw, editor at AuburnDaily.com. We started a series at Auburn Daily earlier, uh, earlier this week, Lance, stat of the day, and so... Yesterday, I dove into how first-year transfer quarterbacks did in the SEC last year, which is important because, obviously, Zach Calzada, Robbie Ashford, those two guys have a chance to start for the Tigers in 2022. And so, before we kind of look at all the individual quarterbacks, Lance, my question to you is, those six quarterbacks that we looked at combined 654 of 1,048 passing, that's 62%. If Calzada or Ashford win the job at Auburn, could they have a better completion percentage than 62%? Yeah, I think that's the one thing that you have to look at there is whether or not Auburn could have a quarterback surpass that number. And I think that, you know, we've seen quarterbacks recently at Auburn struggle to even get to, what, 55 56% Bo Nix during a couple of years. He's definitely struggled. TJ Finley uh, has not been the most accurate quarterback during his limited time here with the Tigers. But I will say this. You look at Brian Harson's offense, right? It's more of a pro-style scheme. You were talking about that on yesterday's show with Charlie Five, talking about sure. dual-threat quarterbacks and pocket passers. I think that the short to intermediate passing game that Auburn's going to try and incorporate this season, I think you're going to get to see a little bit more efficiency out of the quarterback spot. So I certainly believe that whether it be Calzada, whether it be Finley, whether it be Ashford, whoever it may be, I think they'll have the opportunity to get to 62% completion percentage or potentially surpass that. It's just a question of whether or not they will. And I'll say this, if we're looking at maybe specifically Calzada here, it would concern me a little bit after looking at his numbers, uh, Texas A&M last season. And there was a crowd last season in the Auburn fan base that was complaining about how hard Bo Nix threw the football. Well, if you think that's an issue, Zach Calzada is not your guy because he has he does not possess a lot of touch on short to intermediate passes. So I think there's opportunity within the scheme for these individual quarterbacks to succeed and to get to that number. I don't know if they will, though, based on what we've seen out of them. But there's definitely an opportunity. So you mentioned TJ Finley. He is one of the six quarterbacks that were first-year transfer quarterbacks in the SEC last year, so we'll start with his, his numbers first, but obviously went from LSU to Auburn. Was 70 of 128 passing last season, 54.7%. Uh, so, I mean, you mentioned talking about struggling getting to 55%. He came just short of that 55% mark, but I think we can all agree um, his situation last year was not ideal. And there were drops that also kind of hindered uh, hindered him probably getting to that 55% mark. But, I mean, I think it's a good starting point with this conversation. As far as his first year uh, in this new system as a transfer quarterback last season in conference, um, was not a great start to his Auburn tenure. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think that while drops were also an issue, I think that he's still working through some things mechanically, and I think he's still working on his accuracy. And we got to see in the bowl game, there were several dump-offs against Houston where it was just easy pitching catches, right? Six, seven yards right there in the middle of the field, and he was leaving them all short. He was putting them at the receiver's feet. And so I think while Calzada has the issue of maybe throwing the ball a little too hard, I think TJ Finley, while there were some drops and while he was not put in the best position to succeed, and we, we've talked about this a little bit before Zach off. It's just he was not he was set up to fail essentially. I think that 
he's got to be able to work on some of the things himself. I know that there's some external factors that are contributing to his inefficiency throwing the football, but he's also got to be able to work on himself. And we've gotten to see him progress through spring. Uh, we've heard a lot of different things about his accuracy, about how he's been able to improve in that category. I think a lot of people are pleased with his progression. Was not the best quarterback on the field on a day, but also you saw that a drop from Tavares Dawson, Malcolm Johnson Jr., the touchdown he caught was actually a drop so he's going to need some help from his receivers for sure and uh, of course before uh, i hear people typing in the youtube comments now yes he had he threw a pick that was dropped as well yes you absolutely get that um two full-time starters that were transfers last year in the sec hendon hooker uh, i've talked about how impressed i was with him on the show going from virginia tech to tennessee he threw for 68.2 percent which is really incredible and then you look at Will Levis, who went from Penn State to Kentucky, and you cover Kentucky as well, Lance. Um, 233 of 353 passing, that is 66%. And that's the bulk of what this stat is, or numbers from those two guys, just because they had the largest sample size last season. But if Auburn could get a 65% or higher passer, um, boy, would that be incredible. That would be an absolute huge step forward for this offense and for Brian Harson. Yeah, and I think when you look at those two guys in Hooker and in Levis, I think they possessed things that, unfortunately, I don't know if Auburn has, at least on paper. I think Tennessee sure. had a couple of different receivers that could really stretch the field. Hendon Hooker, a phenomenal downfield passer, also was not turnover prone. I believe his touchdown to interception ratio was something stupid like 31 to three or something crazy like that. Um, but it, it was ridiculous. He was so good at Tennessee last year. But Will Levis, a little bit more of a gambler uh, through, I believe, 13 interceptions, which was the most in the SEC last season. But what he had was one of the best receivers in the entire conference, maybe in, even in the entire country. And Wandell Robinson, someone that was a safety valve that could get him out of a, a jam literally at any part of the field, whether it be short, intermediate or the deep ball. Does Auburn have that guy on roster? I don't know. They've certainly got a lot of different guys that could potentially be safety valves. Maybe not the primary one like John Samuel Schenker, Landon King. I think Javarius Johnson's going to be able to get his touches. They've got certain guys that they can go to and maybe spread out the ball. I just don't know if they if the passing attack has the personnel to be dynamic or explosive. And I'll also say this about the quarterbacks real quick. So on, on the Auburn Daily Show, just uh, just a week or so ago, I broke down TJ Finley and Zach Calzada from an explosive passing standpoint. Uh, TJ, TJ Finley was four of 18 on throws 20 yards or more downfield as a 22% completion percentage. He had one touchdown, no interceptions, but he was averaging 7.9 yards per attempt, which is really, really not good if you're trying to chuck the ball down the field and you're completing 22% right. of your passes. Zach Calzada, not much better. 12 of 33 on throws 20 yards or more downfield. 36% completion percentage there, five touchdowns to one interception. Of course, you have to realize, well, TJ Finley had a much smaller, smaller sample size, but within those two guys' sample sizes, not the best at stretching the field. And I just wonder, you know, what does that look like in year two under Brian Harson? Although I will say this, TJ Finley, like you mentioned, he's got another year in the system. He's got an opportunity to work with some of these guys. Maybe he can develop some of that chemistry. Not sure with Calzada, but he was a decent downfield passer at Texas A&M. But overall, I just don't know if Auburn's on the level of maybe Tennessee or Kentucky in terms of the personnel and the talent that they have. Which is crazy to think about. I mean, just the disaster that Tennessee has been for like the last decade and the fact that Kentucky and football has become what they have so far is, is crazy. We continue this conversation about the transfer quarterback situation in conference with Lance. In just a moment here on Locked on Auburn, I want to tell you about our friends at Built Bar. Built Bar is the protein bar that looks and tastes like a candy bar. Head over to Built.com. You'll see all the different flavors of Built Bar. And hey, if you know for some reason protein bars aren't your thing, Built has a ton of different options and products to help you on your fitness and wellness journey. Built Boost is this powder that you can mix in and kind of get some electrolytes and vitamins and nutrients into your water. It tastes great be sure to check that out they also have built broth uh for cooking or just for consumption on your own whatever you want that for uh, they've got a ton of different products and it all tastes great 
Head over to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your order. Use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off. That is at Built.com. Also, want to tell you about our friends at Fetch Me Home Delivery. Started by Auburn folks. They love Auburn, and Auburn loves them. All of the reviews and feedback that they get from folks throughout the Auburn, Opelika, and Lee County area is fantastic because their service and their care is top notch. Auburn folks take care of Auburn folks. And Fetch Me is a great example of that. They've partnered with a ton of local restaurants in the community as well as chains. They've got a great relationship with a ton of different folks and a great list of uh, partners that you can scroll through on their app or their website at fetchmedelivery.com. And you can get all of these awesome restaurants, food delivered right to your door. And also now at fetchmealcohol.com, they can bring alcohol directly to your door. So fetchmedelivery.com for food, fetchmealcohol.com, of course, for alcohol. Lance, before we jump back into this transfer quarterback conversation, you mentioned the Auburn Daily Show. Tell folks how they can find that every single day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I do a live show every single weekday starting at 4 p.m. It's the Auburn Daily Show. You can go check us out over on YouTube. Just search Auburn Daily. We also live stream not only on YouTube, but on Twitch and Facebook as well. SI underscore Auburn on Twitter if you want to follow and keep up with all of our content over at Auburn Daily as well. Yeah, be sure to check that out. If you're uh, an audio listener, um, you're probably on Facebook. So be sure to check out Auburn Daily there um, as well. Well, all right, so the other quarterbacks that played into this were the South Carolina guys, the guys that went from uh, – Jason Brown went from St. Francis to South Carolina. Zeb Nolan went from NDSU to South Carolina. Both of them throwing um, 55% uh, completion percentage. And to me, like, uh, Auburn should be able to, if Calzada or Ashford starts in 2022 – I just feel like it's going to be a little bit higher than that. Am, am I off on saying that? No, I definitely think that that's very fair to think. And I mean, when you look at all the different quarterbacks in the SEC, I think that Auburn has two or three guys on roster that can be successful, right? They've got some guys that can be successful. It's just to the degree, I think, is the question. When you look at all these different guys, I mean, uh, I think a question that or something that's been brought up a lot whenever you talk about Auburn and their quarterback performances, it's like, well, the offensive line hasn't been fantastic. Well, Bryce Young was in the top five in the SEC in pressure percentage, as was Finley, as was Zach Calzada. He was just a better quarterback. And so I think the question is, does Auburn have that guy on roster that even with the offensive line issues, they can complete a higher percentage than maybe Jason Brown or Zeb Nolan? Can they get the ball to these receivers downfield? unlike Jason Brown or Zeb Nolan. They've got to be able to do that even when pressure is in their face. So I think that it's realistic to expect Auburn has a quarterback that surpasses the production that Brown and Nolan had at South Carolina. I'll also say this, if we're going back to what we were talking about as far as personnel, I think South Carolina's kind of got a couple of interesting receivers uh, that they had last season and they brought over into this season. But I think Auburn overall, their wide receiver core and their tight end core is probably more talented than South Carolina. So I think it's fair to assume Auburn with good coaching is going to be able to get that passing attack going and get those numbers higher. To me, it's about the scheme, right? And like South Carolina's scheme, I think was better than Auburn's last year, as far as yeah. helping guys be better than what they actually are. And I mean, there's Auburn has I'm going to say it. Auburn has really wasted some guys' career at wide receiver. These four-star guys come in and, like, they have what it takes. And they're just not used correctly. And, and there's a million different things that go into that. Scheme, route development, play calling, quarterback efficiency. I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. So it's not like one specific thing. And that was kind of the breath of fresh air that I think a lot of Auburn fans were expecting with Brian Harson coming in. And... It happened to some extent. I think there were several quarterback or several wide receivers that did better last year than they would have in the previous regime. I think Kobe Hudson, who is a natural wide receiver, is an example of that. I think Shedrick Jackson had his best season for a reason last year. And like even um, like Demetrius Robertson, like I think in Gus's system, you know, I, I don't think he's as effective as he would have been. And then, you know, Javaris Johnson. Um, had his moments last season as well. And so I'm excited to see what these guys do 
that have been in the system for a little bit longer, like Tavares Dawson. This is his second year in the system. It's a lot of guys second year in the system. But, you know, I expect to see a big jump as far as receivers being able to create their own space. And if they can't, can Brian Harson and Eric Kiesau scheme them open? And that's just something that we haven't really seen at Auburn. But obviously, when you have open wide receivers, it's going to make life easier for your quarterback. It's going to make reads easier. It's going to make delivering the football easier. There is a much, much larger uh, margin for error. And we just haven't seen that in the past. I think we saw it a little bit last year, but it's going to be real telling to see how much of that we see in 2022. Yeah, I think that development at the wide receiver position was obviously an area of concern under Gus Malzahn. And I think that there were moments last season where we got to see the wide receivers take step forward. I mean, early on in the year, they were not good. There were a lot of drops, a lot of missed opportunities. They couldn't really create separation like you were just talking about. But as the season went, went on, I think we got to see the guys develop a little bit. I think the reason why it was a struggle last season is obviously the tor- turmoil uh, at, during, within the coaching staff, right? Cornelius right. William, Williams being let go after four games, Eric Kiesau having to step up and kind of take over that position. I agree. I think we are going to see the core step up even even better this season because Ike Hilliard's in town. And we've gotten to see what he's uh, done in the NFL. We've gotten to see how he's developed some of these receivers at Pittsburgh and uh, at Washington. I think that he is going to be able to develop some of these second-year guys and really, really make something special out of this core maybe a couple years down the line. I think some of these guys have still – they've got some time left to really figure out what they're about, and I think that it may take some time to, to really, really get the system going and to really, really get I kill your going. But this year, I think we're going to see another step in the right direction. Guys like Tavares Dawson, I think Javarius Johnson, again, like I mentioned earlier, he could be having a really good year. Malcolm Johnson Jr., what does he look like? And then down the line, Amari Kelly, Camden Brown, these freshmen, how do they pan out? I think it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. Lance Dahl, our guest today. When we return in just a moment, Lance put up three trap games that Auburn fans need to pay attention to in 2022. Uh, one of them, one of them's a little shocking. So stay tuned for that. Hey, you can save time and money when using rockauto.com. It is the best and most efficient and cost-effective place to buy all of the parts for your car, truck, or SUV. Look, why would you choose to spend 30, 50, even a hundred percent more for the same parts when you can just go to rockauto.com and check out their expansive inventory you don't have to worry about you know does does a certain warehouse contain certain brands no no they've got it all everything seriously it's crazy go to rockauto.com right now see all the parts available for your car truck or suv all right locked on auburn and there how did you hear about his box so they know that we sent you amazing selection reliably low prices and all the parts your car will ever need that is at rockauto.com all right lance you put up a a piece at auburndaily.com yesterday about the three trap games to watch. Kind of uh, take yeah. us through that if you will. Yeah, so let's start at the beginning of the schedule. So I've got three different games here. Two of them are Power 5 opponents. One of them's a, a group of five school. We'll get to that later because it is later in the schedule. But let's start here with Missouri. It's September 23rd, fourth game of the season. In my opinion, I think this is the most reasonable contest to pin as a trap game. I think it's got the most potential because if you're looking on the surface – When you look at all these preseason magazines and predictions and what Vegas is saying, Auburn's not going to be favored in a lot of games. Quite frankly, a lot of people don't think Auburn's going to a bowl. So you have to kind of look at some of the surefire wins, maybe in conference play, surefire wins in non-conference play, and say, okay, which one of these could be iffy? I think Missouri is one of those games where if Auburn's going to go five and seven, most people, including fans, would just assume, oh, that's a, that's a game Auburn should catch a dub in, right? They should be able to go in at home and beat Missouri, a team that they're arguably, I would say, significantly more talented than them. But you start yeah. to really dig into it. I mean, both these teams are coming off six and seven seasons. Both of them have ter- turmoil at the quarterback position. And what Missouri has done is gone out and gotten Jaden Daniels, transfer from Arizona State. 35 to 13 touchdown interception ratio uh, was like 10 picks to 10 INTs last year at Arizona State, but he's got promise as a quarterback, right? And I think Missouri, with the loss of Tyler Beatty, their bell cow running back, they're going to have to throw the ball a little bit more. They've got a couple of really talented receivers, Mookie Cooper, transfer from Ohio State, Luther Burden, 
five-star receiver uh, in their their uh, recruiting cycle this year. If they have to throw the ball a little bit more, and I'm just this is just speculation. This is not definitive. If they have to throw the ball a little bit more, what does Auburn's secondary look like if they can't generate a consistent pass rush? Got to okay. see it against Penn State. Got to see it against Mississippi State. Right. That's just my concern. Is that maybe Auburn? has a little bit of scheme issue early on in the year, and they're still working the kinks out. They've just played Penn State. They're coming off of a tough game. What does Auburn's defense look like? Can they can they keep, can they they get Missouri off the field on third down whenever they need to? Or will this efficient passing game that Missouri could potentially have, again, nothing's definitive, could potentially right. have, does it give Auburn problems? Also, what does Auburn's quarterback position look like four weeks into the season? Maybe Auburn struggles against Penn State and they've got to rework things, right? So this is just a potential trap game. I'm not saying that it's definitive, but it's a possibility uh, on their schedule. Zach, what do you think about that? I think it's interesting. I mean, your arguments make sense. Um, the fact that it's in Jordan-Hare Stadium makes it less trap gamey to me. Um, when I think trap game, and, and there's no perfect definition of a trap game, but just the first thing that comes to mind is when a team is favored by 14 points going on the road. That that that's kind of what I think a trap of trap game. Um, and I think Auburn will be favored against Missouri, and obviously it, it's at home. So I, I, I it would be bad. Like people will call for Brian Harson's job if Auburn loses that game. Right. And, and, and my thing is, like, if you look at Auburn's schedule, there's not going to be a lot of road games that Auburn's favored in this season. I mean, they have to go on the road to Mississippi State and Ole Miss. They've got to go on the road to Alabama, to Georgia. There's just not a lot of opportunity for Auburn to right. go into a road environment and say, we can take control of this game and win it fairly, fairly easily. So for me, when doing this, I had to look at some of the home games. And Missouri Fair was enough. the first one. The second one here was Arkansas. Yep. This is October 28th. And some right. people may hear that and immediately think about, well, Arkansas went nine and four last season. They were a top 25 team. They're going to be a preseason top 25 team this year. And you're right. I think they're going to be a good team. But here's the thing. Arkansas only brings back nine combined starters, six on offense, three on defense. What does that look like under Sam Pittman, who is still trying to get the program on its feet in terms of recruiting? Curious to see what that looks like. Also, Arkansas is really struggling at receiver, so it may take them some some time to really pan some of those guys out. And you look at their schedule, incredibly difficult. The, in the first half of the schedule, they play Cincinnati, South Carolina, A&M, and Alabama. And then before they play Auburn, they go on the road to Mississippi State and BYU, which is so weird that they're playing BYU right in the middle of the season, but it's whatever. Yeah. But the point being, there's a realistic chance Arkansas could be somewhere between 4-3 and three and 2-5. and five by the time they play Auburn, depending on how bad things get. And so what I'm saying is while Arkansas may have a bad record or they may be under 500 or they may be struggling, they're still a really talented football team. And it could catch Auburn by surprise, considering that this game is in between road trips to Mississippi State and Ole Miss, right? They may be looking ahead if Ole Miss is a really good team, which I don't think is a characteristic of a Brian Harson team. But if we're just Talking about potential trap games here, I think it's fair to assume that that's a possibility. But this Arkansas team, I think, is going to be better than what their record indicates. I don't believe the saying that you are what your record says you are. I think it's nine and four for Arkansas last season could have probably been been eleven and one, twelve and zero in the Pac-12, right? Eleven and sure. one in the Big Twelve, right? So I, I just think that this think is they going to be a little bit last year too. Like even in did. the SEC, like were they were they nine and four good or were they like? And I mean, just watching them, especially when Auburn played them, like probably more of like a seven and five team. For something, some things did bounce their way. I'll say that. And I think that's even more re reason that to believe that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Right. I think that there's even more reason to believe that they could take a slide like ESPN's FPI, which is always on something, whatever it is. I want to have some of it, but they <laughs> project ESPN's FPI or excuse me. ESPN thinks that Arkansas will go six and in, in, uh, six and six or seven and five this season. It's like six point yeah. five, five point five. Um, so it could be one of those games where it's just like, okay, Auburn is somehow like what seven and two, seven and three, six and three, somewhere like someone, something like that. And they're heading into this game expected to win it. They're favored by eight and a half points. And all of a sudden on an 11 AM game on the sec network, Arkansas's offense explodes and Auburn doesn't have enough firepower to catch back up. It, it's like it, this game gives me 2021 Mississippi state vibes. I don't know why it just does. I get it. I get it. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think Auburn beats Arkansas this year, and I think they beat Missouri. So I think you putting them as trap games makes sense. What's your third one? And I'll, I'll say this. I, I don't think that the, 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 the way you go about trying to peg trap games, at least in my opinion, is looking at the games that Auburn should win. Right. And even some of the games at home, that Mississippi State game has scarred me permanently. So I will forever be looking at the games at home and just be like, okay, which team has a really good passing attack? Because I'm I'm really, really scared about that. And this final team, actually, speaking of passing attack, uh, had a really, really good one last year. It was actually the best in the country. Western Kentucky. Now, the Hilltoppers don't bring back a ton of production on the offensive side of the ball. They lost Uh their really talented quarterback. They lost a couple of their receivers. But they've still got a lot of talent on roster, and their unit last season averaged 44.2 points per game. That was second nationally. Their passing attack, first in the country, averaged 443 passing yards per game. They're still going to be relatively lethal, okay? And this goes back to what I was saying about Missouri, is Auburn struggled against Mississippi State's air raid last season, right? What happens when this defense faces an efficient passing attack, right? That's just my concern. And you may say, well, Auburn's defense could fi- have that figured out by the end of the season. Yeah, well, they didn't against Mississippi State last year. And so uh, the, the concern there, I think, is, is legitimate. Now, should Auburn win this game by 40? Probably. But if things fall off the rails for Auburn this season, right, and they are definitely out of bowl contention and things have just kind of gone wrong, does Auburn get up for a game against Western Kentucky in between games uh, against Texas A&M and Alabama? Right? No. I, I just I in just that didn't. world, no, that doesn't happen. Yeah, and so I think that there's there is concern. There there would be legitimate con- concern in that scenario. I think that's why it's a potential trap game. Interesting, interesting. That's um that's good. It's good to think about, and I think you lay out good points. And uh, and I'm with you. That Mississippi State game from last year, is just like you know I, it was um. I asked several folks that have come on over the last few weeks what, um, like, if you had to pick three games that Auburn would win in SEC, like, which three are you most comfortable with? And Justin Ferguson said Mississippi State was one of his. And I'm like, I just can't get there. I just can't yeah. get there based on what happened last year. So I, I'm right there with you. And it's in Starganistan. That's right. That's it's... right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That makes some people mad when you say it, but I hate that place. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. I mean, oh, no disrespect. I just hate the place. Lance, one more time. How can people find you, hear you, watch you, all that good stuff, brother? Yeah, they can follow me on Twitter at Lance Stahl underscore. Listen to the Auburn Daily Show every single day, weekday, excuse me, live streaming on YouTube. You can also check out the Locked On Kentucky podcast if you have any interest in just hearing about Kentucky athletics for whatever reason. Sure, right. Lance Daw, thank you so much, my friend. We'll be back tomorrow right here on Locked On Auburn. See ya.